Yes, yes, team. Welcome to another episode of the Total Mental Performance Podcast. Today we have Christian Chapman. He's the co-founder of the Physique Collective. He's a well-known coach in the bodybuilding world. And I met him at the coaching convention in Manchester. And he came up to me. He he was one of the speakers. We're chatting away the night before. On the day he goes, are you shitting yourself? And I said, I'll be totally honest. I'm not, I love this stuff. And he went, fuck you. (laughs) And then walked off. And I was like, I like this guy. And uh, he delivered an incredible, incredible talk uh, when he was there. And uh, I said to him, mate, I'd love you to come onto the podcast. I'll let you know when I'm back in England. If not, you can come out to Dubai. And he goes, I'm there on a plane. Here you are, mate. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Pleasure, pleasure. I, uh, it feels surreal, to be fair. Because yeah, I remember that coach convention moment. I was the palest man in the room, for sure. Uh, that was pretty scary. Well, when we talk about emotions and a lot of what we do at yep. Total Men's Performance is owning emotions. And to see you go, I'm shitting myself, and then you went and did it anyway. Yeah. Pretty cool. cool. Feel the fear, do it anyway. Yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to be a bit more active on that because I'm very, I stay in my zone. I'm comfortable here. I'm happy here kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Whereas I know that if you come out of that, you're probably going to be a bit better person after it kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it was a, uh, as soon as I walked in there, it was the venue made me shit myself. Mm. It was big. Is that the first time you've done something like that? Yeah, it was the first time I'd done something like that. And I think if it was a room filled with filled with people that I didn't know, I wouldn't care. Mm. But because it's people that I've got, people that I've respected who are also talking at the same time, and I probably know 75% of the room. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's like, fuck, they're all here to watch me what the fuck am I doing here? (laughs) Do you know what I mean? And for context, I think there's about 200 people there and it was held at the monastery in Manchester, this massive grand church. And the way they set it out as well, as soon as you stepped out on stage, you could see the size of the place. You could see the depth of people and you can kind of see that. And for me, I love that stuff. I really, when I used to box, obviously that's all up in stage. It's in front Mm -hmm. of the lights, the the bigger the crowd, it more gets you up for it. But if that was my first ever talk, yeah, that would have been with 75% of people in the room that you know yeah. and then lots of people you've looked up to and respected. Yeah, that, that was big. So that yeah. was when Free afterwards myself. I was like, mate, come on the podcast. Yeah, threw myself into the deep end. But you coming over to me and, and suggesting that kind of made me think, oh, well, I just must have done okay. Hmm. But big imposter syndrome moment, which I know you heavily focus on as well. For sure. Your work, for sure. So run us through your story. Where does it all start out? Oh, fuck. Okay. How, how far back do you want to go? Where was you born? Um, just north of Birmingham. Uh, hence the little bit of a brummy mm. twang. Yeah, about 10 miles north of Birmingham. Um, good family life. You know, parents still together, you know, brought it well, got an older brother. Um, did the school thing, hated school. I'm a big person on, like, if I'm doing something I don't enjoy, I switch off, yeah. don't pay attention, don't revise. And pretty much the majority of school, I didn't like any subject. So it was, don't revise. I'll wing it on the day kind of guy. And I really feel like I've winged my, my life, to be honest. How I've ended up here, I'm like, I've fully winged this, but it's fucking worked. So who cares kind of thing, you know what I mean? Did my A-levels, definitely didn't go to uni, not my kind of thing, wanted to dive straight into work. Got into the hospitality industry for about seven, eight years. So ran bars, restaurants, nightclubs, hotels. And I think that's where the personable side comes in because if you want to be good at that you need to know everyone in the room because normally if you're working in a place that's the main hub of somewhere central let's say Birmingham it's the same faces Mm. every single week if you remember people people like you yeah yeah. I didn't have a fucking clue what their name was but I remember every drink they order every time it's ready before they even get there do you know what I mean so I think I think that's massively carried its way through to this because I can remember having a conversation with someone recently, like, how do you remember everyone? Because when you work with 120, 130 clients, how the fuck do you remember yeah. them? And I just do. I remember random facts, random numbers about someone. If you said, how much did, shout out Calvin Maguire, I don't know why he's just coming to my head, but I was, who, was I, who I was talking to recently. If you told me to say what, what he weighed last week on, on the, and that's amongst 120 other people. And are you coaching 120 people one-to-one? Yeah. Directly through you? Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, so we'll, we'll get we'll get onto that because that is a, a whole other story. So did that, fell out of love with 
being in bars. You work until 4 a.m. You haven't really got life. People talk to you like shit. Not my kind of thing in the end. Loved it. I had a fucking right laugh. It was a riot whilst I was young. Loved it. You know, you're out every night. And I'm not, I'm not exactly a party animal. I'm not a big drinker. Don't do drugs. Um, stuff like that. But just being around people mm. all the time and being the hub of energy and, you know, people know me as like, uh, back in the day, it was like, you're the showman. Like, everyone comes to see you. You know what I mean? I think that's, again, massively led in, into this. Because when someone wants to work with you, they want to work with you because of you. Mm. No one's coming to me because of my fucking physique. They're not. Because if you want that, you go to someone else. They're coming to me because it's it's Christian. I get on with him. It's personable, all that kind of thing. So came out of that, went into the wholesale side, side of it briefly, and then fell into car sales. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, Fuck yeah. Yeah, random, but... Uh, Cars are a big, big passion line. No like, way. It's bodybuilding and cars. You're in a great city for it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so they're my two main passions. So I was right. I know I can sell because my dad's a natural, has been a salesman his whole life and has always said, you're exactly like me. Sell sand to the Arabs, whatever saying, you know. Um, so I did that for about three years. I also went on like quite a drastic weight loss journey during that time, just before getting into car sales i was 20 stone fat just out of shape always had issues with eating whether that's been constantly restrictive or just fucking eating the world to get to 20 stone um so yeah had quite a long you know experience with eating disorders whilst i was growing up either too thin too fat always liked bodybuilding um and I just decided to like get into it seriously, seriously. Did a diet, lost, you know, like nine stone over the course of a year. Um, and I'm a very, very obsessive person. So when, I, when I'm going to do something, I've got to go fucking all out, nonstop. Like ext- everything I do is extreme. Like you invite me out to Dubai, kind of felt, felt good with something in my personal life where I was like, right, I need to spend some time alone. Right, I'm going to go to Dubai on my own. Do you know what I think? Mm. You can be alone in the UK, but I have to be extreme. Sometimes that bites me in the ass, but one of them. So I'd started helping just people for free. Um, close friends, like, how the hell have you lost all that weight? Um, I was like, I'll, I'll show you. So I started doing it. I remember being on a podcast with AJ Morris. And this was, fuck, six years ago or something like that. He's like, would you ever be an online coach? I was like, no. Everyone's doing it. Don't want to be like that. You know, it's too saturated. And that's six years ago. I was saying it was saturated. It's really saturated mm. now, but it's a good thing, in my opinion, anyway. Shit always falls to the bottom. Cream always rises to the top in any industry, no matter how saturated. So, um, yeah, I was on that podcast. I remember saying that. And then I just ended up starting helping more people, started charging for it, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember it getting to the December before the pandemic and I had about 20 clients, 25 clients. And I was constantly like trying to level up the service. I started working with someone who would be known as probably one of the best in the industry. You know, he started doing loom videos. I started doing loom videos. You know, I was just trying to level it up all the time whilst working the job. And it got to January that year. I was like, right, I'm going to make a plan here. I'm going to leave. This year, I'm going to leave. But I'm like a, I'm not a risk taker at all. If I'm going to do something or I'm going to spend money or I'm going to potentially affect my earnings and how I get by in life, I have to think over it all day, every day, go to sleep on it, wake up thinking about it. I'm just not a risk taker. I think there's positives and negatives to that, but I've made it here, so it's sweet. (laughs) It's worked. Um, So I was like, right, I I want 50 clients before I left, which... When I think back to now, that's fucking stupid. So I made like kind of, I remember just writing notes down on my phone whilst I was working at BMW and Mini upstairs. And I kind of like, right, this is what I'm going to do. And I was like, screenshot it, send it to my dad. I've run everything from it. My dad's like my business advisor. Amazing. He goes through everything with me. He's also now my accountant as well, which is great. Um, dad, if you listen, thanks. So um, March comes, COVID's happening. I'm thinking, fuck what's going to happen here and they shut the showrooms and were sent home and I thought that's completely fucked my plans 
I had about 30 people at the time. The first week of the pandemic, I lost one and gained 12. I thought, fuck. All right, how am I going to manage this? Mm -hmm. And I can remember it was building up, building up. And I probably stayed steady around like 40. At the time, I was like, right, I've got all day at home. I can just make this into a business. I can't sell cars from here. I've got my work laptop. I was doing everything on my work. Didn't have a personal laptop. Mm -hmm. I was doing all my work through that. And um, I remember being in the back garden with my dad. I went around to sit with my parents. And I was about 50 clients. And I was like, Dad, I'm so stressed. I can't, I can't handle this. I can't handle this. He said, well, there's where your business is flawed. You're going to be capped at that. And I remember getting a month down the line. I was like, man, 50 is fucking walking a park. Mm. It's like riding a bike. I say this to so many clients. I do quite a lot of consultations with new coaches coming up, how to be more efficient and stuff like that. Um, and it is like riding a bike. If you've done 5,000 check-ins on Loom, you can do a check-in like that. I don't even need to look at someone's sheets. I can do it as we're going and just freestyle. Let's go, let's go. Um, and by the time I got called back into work, I had 85 clients and they rang me and I was one of the last people to go back in because um, they were like steadily bringing mm. people back in. And I remember them ringing me and it was the head of business that rang me who, I can't lie, I fucking hated this guy. He didn't like me. I didn't like him. The, the first time he met me, he said, I don't like you already. I was like, fuck, this guy's nice. Um, so a big fuck you to him. Um, and he rang me and said, oh, we, we, we want to get back in the business. And it'll be on um, next Wednesday. And I fucking, my ass fell out. I thought, oh, fuck, like, am I going to, is this going to work? You know, all this sort of stuff. I've, even 85 clients, but I felt like vulnerable, like, fuck, you know. So I went in the day before they called me back. I was like, I'm just going to say I'm not coming back. That's it. And oh, my stomach, bro, on the way over. I just felt violently ill. Awful. Mm. <laughs> so I get there and I saw my boss, Will, fucking legend. Okay. Best guy I've ever worked for. Hilarious. I said, he was like, you here a day. And I said, yeah, I need to talk to you. He was like, you're leaving, aren't you? I was like, yeah. And he said, fucking fair play. And I was like, right, let's go. And I was like, you know, I can't give you a notice because I can't work it. So this is my last last day. And then I remember it's still on my Instagram, a, a video of me driving home from there and saying like, I've just quit my job. Like, what the fuck? And I feel like during that journey, because I was doing like a photo shoot prep during COVID, everyone was like so invested in watching this. Like everyone was so happy for me. Like, and I love that. Like I love Instagram. Okay, as much as it, it, that is my job, Instagram is the job. I don't have a fucking website. Instagram's my website. You know, if you want to know everything about me, go on there. And, you know, a lot of people don't want to share too much of their personal life. I, I do, because I know people are invested in it. But sometimes when something shit happens in your personal life, you don't want it on fucking Instagram mm -hmm. and people start digging and lots of stuff, which I've definitely found out recently. Um, but left there, and then it's just been absolutely fucking mental since and I think in the last in the last 12 months it's probably averaged between 120 130 clients every month without fail um, and I fucking love every minute of it everything about it I just love it and that brings us here and then in that time as well we started Physique Collective so Physique Collective is like um, an app okay you can use it on the website and stuff like that it's a forum a bodybuilding forum kind of, edu well, not kind of, very education-based, okay? Um, but ease of learning. Like, there's so much shit out there that I don't know what the fuck you're on about. And our kind of, like, motto at the start was, like, Christian needs to understand it. If we're going to put something out, if I understand it, anyone will. I'm basic, mm -hmm. okay? Tell it to me straight. I know what it means, okay? Um, and it is, our slogan is physique development simplified. And... We put out educational-based content that's backed up by, you know, studies, papers, all that sort of stuff. And we've tried to build a community around it. Um, and that's what it massively is now. Like, the people who are on the site, and we've got like a 1,000 members now, which is cool. Everyone feels part of something with it. I don't want to be that guy that you can't approach. If anyone sees us at a show, people come over. And we love that. And people have described it as like, it's a family now. Hmm. Um so that's been going for the last like year and a half now, which is cool. It's really picking up momentum this year. Got a seminar 
coming in March, which again I'm speaking at. Fuck. <laughs> For those that aren't watching this and they're listening, Christian just sort of fell into himself a little bit. Mm-hmm. Big time. Um, gives me the anxiety. So, yeah, and then a consultancy business that's come off the back of that as well. Just helping coaches. You pay for an hour of my time. You can learn about any topic you want. A lot of it is coaches who are trying to level up their business or go from, I need to go from 50 clients to, to 80 or whatever. Um, how am I going to get there? Right, I'm going to pick apart your fucking business. This is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Start doing this. And to be honest, most people just go away from it more confident with what they're doing anyway. Um, or coaches that are just starting out. Or if it's anything kind of like PD based, like how do you prep a female for a prep? How do you prep a guy for a prep? Stuff like that. So just peak weeks, stuff like that for for an hour. Yeah, I think that brings us up to date. The obsessiveness. Yeah. Where does that come from? You know what? I have no idea. And the reason why I have no idea is because no one's ever asked me that. All right, let's let's play a game. Okay. I want you to think about the obsessiveness. When are you more obsessive? When I'm at work. Mm-hmm. Um, if I start doing something, I have to become the best at it. Okay. Unfortunately, I like a sport that is incredibly genetic based. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's I'm why I don't a, play basketball. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I love basketball, but I'm, I'm 5'11". Um, six foot on Tinder, of course. Mm. Um, so, yeah, if I get into it, it's like, right, how the fuck do I get the best at here? Right, I can't be the best bodybuilder. I know that. And I'm fucking cool with that. I don't care. I can be the best coach though. Okay. And my kind of like motto is, do you know when people have their niche? My niche is I can fucking coach anyone. I don't care if you're Mary down the road who's 70 or an 18-year-old junior bodybuilder who's a genetic freak. I don't care. I've coached fucking anyone you can think of and got results. Simple. I'm not a help the busy guy who has a nine to five, who plays basketball on the weekend and, te- you know what I mean, mm. in your bio. I help, I help everyone because I'm a, I'm a helper. Um, but yeah, the obsessiveness is definitely a, just a, when I want something, I'm going to get it. I'm an impatient bastard as well. If I want something, I want it yesterday. So, so how do you get it quicker? Think about this. If you're not the best, what does that mean? I need to get better. Mm-hmm. So, Why? Because, ah, and is this, uh, what's the word? Vain. I like to be thought of in Mm. good light. And if you're not thought of in good light, what does that mean? I haven't performed my best to that person. I know you can't please everyone. Mm. I get that. But I fucking, (laughs) I really do try. I I don't like when someone, someone says something negative about me, I'm like, I do that's a big downfall of mine. I take everything quite personally. I know it's not a personal attack. People are trying to help me potentially better myself. But I'm like, no, I fucking, that's not right. Mm. That's not right. <laughs> For sure. So think about the obsessiveness. Think about the part of you that has to be the best. Where in your body would you point to as to where you experience that? Think about a time when that's happened. Is it in your head, your chest, your stomach, your back? In my stomach, for sure. Is it heavy or is it like? No, it's like it. If it's good, it's like an uplifting, oh, mm. like a relaxing thing. I feel everything from my stomach. If I'm nervous, I'm anxious. I feel like I'm going to shit myself. Mm. You know? <laughs> and that, that starts at the stomach. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. So follow that feeling back. When is the first time this obsessiveness, this, God, I'm doing it. I've got to be better. I've got to be the best. Yeah. Where do you think that started? Definitely in hospitality. A hundred percent. Because my first shift... I was put on, I was a bar back. I was like, I need to get on the fucking bar because that's where the action is. Mm. And I don't want to be thought of, I'm the glass collector. So I did one shift there and rang them. I said, I want to be on the bar this week. Can you do me some training? I didn't know what fucking anything was. No idea on spirits. No idea how to do a cocktail, nothing. And I learned it from Wednesday to Friday. And my first shift on the bar was on Friday. Mm. I was like, I'm going to fucking smash this. Right, how do I go from bartender to the manager of the place? How do I go from manager to GM, et cetera, et cetera. And I did it over a seven year span of like your bartender, your bar assistant, your restaurant manager, bar and restaurant manager, general manager. And by the end of it, you know, I had a team of a hundred people underneath me. And I was like, right, I've completed that now. 
when now what? Yeah, now yeah. what? And it was like you can you can own a bar. Fuck that. I used to be terrible at dealing with stress. Terrible. Um, that's why I'm bald. A lot of people think it's the PDs. It's not. Um, I started losing when I was like nineteen, twenty, just through stress. You know, just used to fucking fall out, man. Um, and I used to be terrible at dealing with that, and um, put far too much pressure on myself and stuff like that. So, so think about where you are today. Twelve months from now, if you got what you came for, how would you know? If you went right, imagine we sat here again in twelve months from now, and you've like, I've done it, I fucking nailed it, I've I've pulled this off, whatever this is. Mm-hmm. How would you know? I've realised this is never ending, mm. unfortunately, and I'm proud of where I've got to, and you know, I've done some cool things and stuff like that. But there is always someone doing more or doing better, or has more business, or has you know is happier than you. I'm just constantly struggling. I've got it tattooed on me, actually. Never settle. Because I just don't ever settle for things. You know, and I think to say next year, oh, I sat here and I made it last year. I don't think that exists. Not necessarily I made it, but you came, well, you got what you came for. Yeah, okay. So, so yeah. This, so I've got some business goals this year, for sure. 2023, mm-hmm. I got what I came for. Yeah. I turned up to the 2023 restaurant. They delivered the the starter, the main, the dessert. Drinks were amazing. Loved it. Yeah. Five stars. What do I do from there? No, no. If you'd done, if, if that had happened, how would you know? I mean, I write down everything that mm. I'm going to do. Like, I'm obsessive with my notes on my phone. Awful with it. Um, if I, I get, like, major mental satisfaction out of, like, ticking a goal off. Mm-hmm. And I always use the tick emoji on my phone. Sad as fuck, I know. Um, and there's a list of a lot mm. <laughs> for 2023. But that like... What's the top three? Right. Sorry. <laughs> so the biggest one for this year is just gone into business with someone regarding opening our own gym. So that's a big fucking lofty goal to be honest and it scares the shit out of me but I'm fucking ready for it and I know I know it will work I know it will it has to simple so that's that's goal one (laughs) fuck okay get physique collective to two and a half thousand members this year and do our first seminar which is already boxed off but you know what I mean a couple of months time and I'm also going to be developing so, you know, like an ebook, mm-hmm. a video ebook, okay, for up and coming coaches in industry that I fucking wish I had when I started. And I've started making the list of videos for this. <laughs> and I'm already at about 80 videos. And I'm thinking, fuck, how am I going to do this? But it's so that my problem with this industry, I'm looking at the camera now because you're going to do this as a reel. My problem with this industry is. If you learn from someone's shit, yeah, you then become a coach. You're also probably going to be shit because that's all you've learned. That's all you know. All you know is a WhatsApp diet, okay? No contact out of certain hours, all this shit, okay? If someone comes to me and they want to learn, I want them to learn the best, okay? Because that then looks good on me as well as them, okay? There is enough people in this world for everyone to have fuck loads of clients and do really well. There is. There is. There's fucking billions of people out there. I want them to be delivering the fucking best. Okay. And if I'm capable, which I think I am, I know I am, of going through a cycle of this is how you start your business. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. And your end product, then you have a business. I want to be able to give that to people. Okay, granted, it's a selfish thing as well, because I'm getting paid for that, okay? But it's to make the industry a better place, because there's a lot of fucking shit. But there's also a lot of good. Mm. I want to give the good and help people learn. And there's a long fucking... <laughs> you don't realise, it's like, like, what do you do when a client leaves? How do you handle this? How do you handle that? How do you come up with a business name? I, it's going to cover everything. I need to do that <laughs> this year. I need to do that. If I can box those three big things off, I've, 
fucking smash 2023 because it, I remember writing a post at the start of 2023 saying, this year is scaring the shit out of me already. And it's January the 1st. But I need it to because that means it's going to be fucking big. You know, if it doesn't scare you, you're fucking not, you're not doing enough, in my opinion. What parts of Christian needs to die in order for you to pull that off? What parts of you today, whether that's thoughts, feelings, emotions? So I've actually been having a lot of therapy recently. And I'd like to say, and James will back me up. I, I see James Elliott and um, he's basically said, I've completed, <laughs> I've completed therapy. And I did it in quite a short space of time of stuff that I wanted to improve on myself. And a lot of that comes down to, one, how I handle stressful situations, not act like a child in those situations. Um, don't throw your toys out the pram if something doesn't go your way kind of thing. Think everything happens for a reason. Chill, okay. Um, and kind of what else needs to die is my self-loathe, okay. I don't see what other people see. I know, I, I think in the last six months, I've, it's only now that I've realised, are oh, you actually quite good at this? I self-doubt so much, you know, even little things which I don't realise make a massive dim, uh, impact on me, which James massively highlighted to me. It's like, I speak to myself like shit. That ain't helping. You know, I need to believe in myself more because I've massively put myself down. And I think when you're so busy all day, every day, you get caught up in it and you don't, take a step back and think you know what mate fucking hell you've done well here okay and you're it's okay to say that do you know what i mean i used to think that no because you can always do better you can always do better but if you think like that you will never be fucking satisfied ever and sometimes it's okay to be satisfied about something that you've done you think fuck it good work bro you know i'm con i'm saying it to 130 people a week no well probably about 130 of them are fucking pissing around Okay, but those 100 people, I'm saying, fucking, you know, buzzing, you've smashed it. I don't have that. I have to do it myself. You know what clients ask me around that stuff? That good enough, proud, this, that, the other. Like, yeah, but Kieran, what do you think? Mm -hmm. And I always say, doesn't matter what I think, pal. It's what you think. 100%. It does not matter what I think. Because at the end of the day, you know, you can achieve everything you want to achieve. You can get all the results. But if the bottom line is you still have that self-loathing or don't feel like you're enough or worthy, and I've been through many, many of those cycles, mm -hmm. what's the point? Yeah. I think a lot of it comes down to like previous relationships and stuff as well. Um, Coaching relationships, personal relationships. Personal relationships, not feeling good enough for someone, you know, get treated like shit and stuff like that. And you just accept it. And then you think, well, I'm not good enough or, you know. And when I look back on, on certain things, this is years, years back, years back now. It's not my recent stuff here like it's had a massive like psychological effect on me in terms of like the way i look and stuff like that and the way i feel about myself oh you're a fat prick or whatever like you know i'll constantly say that and i know that that's not helping me was that something that, that a previous partner said to you yeah hmm. it's fascinating so at tmp we work a lot on total men's performance insofar as the business leadership coaching side how can you be a fucking leader that holds an organization and takes you to a completely different league? Mm -hmm. But something that's not really spoken about a lot and we don't really speak about it too publicly is the personal side, is your relationships. And what relationships do is they take all of your insecurities and you might feel insecure perhaps if you're a new coach getting onto Instagram. Uh, you might get a little bit insecure doing that. Mm -hmm. What relationships do is they take a magnifying glass to all of your insecurities and then they hold them all up. And that comment about being a fat prick, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or you're a woman. Mm -hmm that can fucking hit to the core. I remember for me, my thing was always, was always my shoulders for years and years and years. I remember when I was boxing, so I was saying, got quite like skinny shoulders and that was stuck in the back of my head because then I equated, well, my good fighters must have wide shoulders. Good fighters look like fucking Tyson Fury or Andy Ruiz or AJ. There's so many different physique types. It doesn't matter. That's an athletic pursuit. But then uh, a girlfriend I had in London, she, she said, I, I insecurely asked her, like, where, where do you think I like, need to get better? I like, can like the way I look or the way that I am or whatever. And she goes, oh, I think you're great. But your shoulders definitely need to be wider. You need bigger shoulders. And the second time, the same comment hit me. Mm. And then all of a sudden, all I could see was my shoulders are too small. My shoulders are too small. My shoulders are too small. And then you start overthinking, you start overanalyzing. And I think 
one comment from somebody very close to you can just completely trigger you into, oh my God, I'm not enough yeah. in some certain way in certain scenarios and relationships. Mm -hmm. I basically see that with a magnifying glass on. So it's like 5X or 10X is the pain in which you feel, particularly mm -hmm. from a partner. And if you've got a partner that's got their own bullshit that they need to work through and they're projecting their stuff onto you and you start to internalize that, that's where things get difficult. Yeah, massively, massively. I, I carry everything to the grave. If someone says something about it, I will remember it and I'll hold a grudge. And I can't, I can't forget things. I can't. Whether that's a failing of myself, I don't know. Um, letting it affect me would be the failing. It's okay to remember these things and stuff like that, but I'm trying to transition away from like, right, that's one person's opinion on you. There's thousands of other people that have a great opinion on you. Let's focus on that. It's like, I always think about it's like YouTube videos. You get loads of comments and you're always going to remember the negative one. Hmm. You don't remember the fucking positive ones or someone comment on your post or whatever, you know, it is pathetic. One man's anyway. hero is another man's clown. And, you know, in, in the space in which I work in, people are like, wow, like what you guys do is really amazing, really inspiring. And back when I used to work in software sales in London, a lot of people were like, my fucking self-help prick, <laughs> you know? And, and that's just, that's just yeah. part of it. You know, who does he think he yeah. is? It goes back to when I said, you know, you can't please everyone. No, but when you actually understand that, well, you know, you don't necessarily have to be everyone's hero, but if you are going to work with a very specific type of individual or whatever, and that doesn't necessarily have to be like the busy nine to five, that could just, for, for us, it's ambitious individuals. We fucking love the ambitious mind. That's the thing that makes us fascinated. What makes these people tick? Why do they tick that way? How is that? What's taking them to one league isn't what's going to take them to the next league. And how can we break that glass ceiling? How can we identify that and smash it? That's the stuff that, that we are. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've read um, Simon Sinek's The Infinite Game. No. I'm going to send you a copy. Sweet. Um, I'm going to write that down. But um, The Infinite Game is such a powerful, powerful book. And it talks about finite games and infinite games. And infinite games are the games that you should play forever. So for me, my personal infinite game is to help ambitious individuals achieve psychological freedom and peak performance. And that for me starts in the mind. That all starts up here in your emotions and the way in which you perceive your reality. Mm -hmm. So I'll play that game forever. But when you're playing the finite game of, I've got to get here, 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 it gets completely stuck. Yeah. So go a layer deeper. You spoke about self-loathing and I spent years, years. I didn't even realize that was the case. I thought that was just normal. Mm -hmm. I had such a low opinion of myself as an athlete, as a business person, as just me. The relationships part really resonated with me. I always never felt enough in relationships. Yep. I used to have this um, fear of abandonment. I was always gonna be abandoned. I was always gonna be left. And, and as a result, I used to behave in ways upon which that would then eventually happen because I was so clingy and so yep. needy and come back to, um, all this stuff comes back to weird parts of your life. But for me, it came back to my boxing coach. Um, he was like my hero. He was the only person I spoke to about my emotions. Outside of that, I didn't speak to anyone else. And then women kind of want you to open up a little bit and, and talk yeah. about your stuff. So then the direct connection was when my coach passed away when I was 17, what's the point in opening up with someone because they're just going to leave you anyway? Yeah. And that was the fear of abandonment. Mm -hmm. She's just going to leave anyway because that's what happened. But unconsciously, you have no idea. And I find that just understanding First of all, understanding that connection is the first step to cutting that connection. And that was for me when I realized I was afraid that everyone was going to leave me. Mm -hmm. Now I'm very much just in my lane. And it's like, well, come along for the journey, but it's not the end of the world. Yeah. For you, where do you think that self-loathing came from? Was it just that relationship or do you think it was something else? I think mul multiple relationships to mm -hmm. me, like, all seem to have ended in the same way. Um, and it really knocks my confidence. And if you were to watch me on Instagram, which you probably have seen, you know, stories, whatever, I come across as the most confident person in the world because it's all an act. Simple. I used to sell fucking cars. You have to act. I don't want to be there, but this guy thinks I'm fucking having a great time, you know, and it is about, I need to show up every day and act like I'm, you know, buzzing. I always say it to clients, like, I could have the worst thing that's happened in the world happen to me. You would never know. Because if I'm depressed on your check-in, do you think you're going to have a good week? Absolutely not. Um, and I think just that knock of like confidence and not being confident in myself um, has majorly affected hmm. the whole life. You know, I'm just not 
people think I'm confident. Like, you know, I think I probably look quite confident right now. I'm not. You know? How do you know? Because I know, I don't know what you fucking, you're going to ask me next. Mm. <laughs> and I don't, I hate not knowing. I don't like the unknown. Interesting. I am OCD organized. I know everything that's happening in my day. What time I need to do this. What time I need to do that. I'm retardedly organized. Like OCD. Like I only found out this year. Well, 2022. I've got ADHD. Bad. Oh, high five. Me yeah, too. ADHD kids. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> nice. Um, but I found that I massively use it to my advantage with work. Of course. Because I can just hyper focus. Yeah. But if you hyper focus for that long, you fucking burn out. I accidentally did it the other day. Um, <laughs> accidentally burn out. <laughs> well, well, so with ADHD, the actual phrase is attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Um, I don't think it's a disorder. I just think it's w we're wired differently. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I got stuck in this project. It was a design project for the website that we're redoing. And off of that, there's like four other little projects off of the redesign and all of this and all of that. It was like two, two, three, and then I got down on a call. I was like, Dan, you know, run through these ideas. What do you think of this? This went back and forth. And then from 3 p.m. until 1 a.m., apart from a 30-minute dinner and toilet break, I just it just disappeared. Mm -hmm. It just disappeared. And what I got done in that time frame was probably more than I got done in the last nine to 10 days yeah. on, on top. So it's a beautiful thing. But yeah. when mismanaged, yeah, it's awful. I think I've learned to manage that just from being ruthlessly organized because being organized calms me down massively if i am out of control of a situation i don't know what's going to happen in a day i don't have my routine nailed i'm stressed if i wake up i know exactly what because i do i wake up monday to sunday knowing exactly what i have to do that day every day and i'll know what i'm doing in three weeks time all day i use it to my advantage but when it comes to disadvantages, when something crops up in my life, I fucking lose my shit. And that's not good, you know, because then it affects my day. And it's like, sometimes I have to take myself out of the space and be like, right, what's actually happened? Someone's knocked your door with the post whilst you're doing a check-in. Fuck me, there's worse things going on in the world than that. Hmm. Do you know what I mean? I let it really get in my head. But often it's not, that's not the issue. No. The issue isn't, the knocking of the door on during the check-in. It's the initial state that's underneath that mm -hmm. of stress, of mm -hmm. overwhelm, of noise. And when you start to learn, okay, well, I can shift this. I can work with this. It's like a double-edged sword. And one, one, one sword is to chop down all the tasks that you've got. Very, very, very sharp. The other side is to chop your shelf down. Also very sharp. And if you swing it one way, if you swing it too much, it's going to come back and, and, and cut you down. But the beauty of having something like ADHD is you'll be able to see the world differently because the way in which you interpret your reality is different. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't realize that that's actually their greatest weapon. And now that you realize that and you can harness that, the key for you is to manage the downside. Yeah. And if you can manage that downside and build that momentum and tap into meaning and purpose and why it is that you're doing what you're doing, right. but then also the limiting beliefs that come with something like ADHD, probably had a lot of messages growing up. Why can't you just concentrate on this? What about this? What about this? Why are you doing this, that, the other? You've forgotten about this. You don't care about me. What about this? And when you get those messages for over that period of time, you often internalize that self-loathing that I'm not enough. But at some point, I don't know if you've done it yet, you have to forgive yourself. Yeah. And I, I, re I really feel like I'm in a sort of massive transitional period, period of my life at the moment. Like I've just moved to a city on my own. Great. I've just come to fucking Dubai on my own. You know, I feel like th this is a never ending sort of trying to be better at not what you said about like harnessing the bad sides of stuff. Mm. I'm genuinely trying to work on it every day. And if I work on something, I know I'm going to get better because I know what I'm like when I work on something. I've got to be the fucking best. So I've got to be the best at harnessing the shit to just be like the, I want some sort of elite level mindset. You know, I remember saying this to James, I was like on like the fourth call with him. And he's like, what do you want to get out of this? And I was like, I just want to not ever be phased by anything. Anything can happen and it doesn't fuck with me. I fuck with that kind of thing. And 
that takes, <laughs> I've realized that takes a long time because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what situation you're presenting with. And I've been presenting with some shit situations in the last couple of months. And I've come out, the be- I've come out of it the other side in a really good fucking position. Like, fuck, if I can do that, man, I've done well there. Give myself some credit. Hmm. Okay, no self-loathing. But the, um, I'm going to, this is random. I'm going to bring it back to something that you said there, like about why can't you focus on this? Why can't you focus on that? I, I tried to sunbathe today to relax. I just end up going back to room doing work. Mm. It's Sunday. I don't work Sundays, mm. but I'm sat there thinking I'm putting energy into this when I could be putting something into actually I really enjoy. And I feel like I've been a, a victim of, and I put it on my stories last night, actually on Instagram. I need to try and fucking remember what I said now. Um, not ev- not everyone knows what's right for you and other people's opinion on what they think is right for you actually isn't right for you. I know what's fucking right for me. Okay. And if that means I work myself into oblivion, but I'm happy doing it, I'm going to keep fucking doing it. I've realized so much in the last couple of months, how much my work means to me. And is that at the detriment of some of my personal relationships? Yes. Am I happy to do that at the moment? Yes because I'm so fucking Hmm. passionate about it that I need to be around people that are making me work even harder. Like coming out here, you know, I think I do pretty well in life. You ain't. Come here (laughs) and you look around and you think, fuck, I'm shit. Hmm. (laughs) You know, but I use it now as a, not put myself down as a, cool man, we're going to fucking, we're going to work hard this year and it's going to be better and better and better. And, when I go back to start, you know, revising for school, I didn't like school, I didn't like this. I put everything into this because I fucking love it. I have to be doing something I love. As soon as I don't enjoy it, I'm done. I remember working in bars. I'd, I remember every time I left somewhere, I didn't even give a notice. I just walked out. I don't like this anymore. See you later. I'm like that. I have to do, I can't do stuff I don't enjoy. And maybe, you know, parts this year maybe I haven't been doing things that I sh- and it's been slowing me down and that, and that annoys me because I know that could have been better that could mm. be better but I'm not going to self-loathe over that and be like, you fucking idiot you should have done better there I'm just going to be like cool man you could have been better there let's go and let's do something about it instead of putting yeah. yourself in the ground do you know what I mean that was a massive tangent I'm sorry I'm going to go back to the question <laughs> fuck <laughs> I can't remember what the question was <laughs> Have you forgiven yourself for that part yet? Yeah. No, I do. I, I genuinely feel in like, I'm not at the elite level mindset yet that I want to be at, but I feel like, I feel happier with myself. Good. And I haven't said that for a long fucking time because there's always been something. Mm. No, that's nagging me or that's nagging me or that's not good. That's not good. I feel, that's good. I'm actually getting emotional about it. Yeah, I don't good. know why. Good. Um, yeah. Because I've I've come out the other side and the end of this year has been rough. Yeah. And like I don't wish the shit on anyone. But I I know I've come out of it as better as a better person. Therapy's played the biggest role. I cannot look, everyone in America has a fucking therapist. Everyone. If you don't, you're weird. Mm. You know, over here it's like, you got a therapist, but are you okay? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm fine. I'm just trying to be a bit better with stuff that I'm struggle with, you know, and I need someone external to help with that. It's like having a coach for bodybuilding. You need mm. one for your head. And you know, my head spirals big time. And um, I've come out of it, you know, it's January. I feel very positive about everything. And I'm just not gonna waste time on stuff that doesn't benefit me anymore. That's exactly why every single coach at TMP is a qualified therapist. And where you can couple the performance and the therapy and the business and entrepreneurial mind all into that 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 part it's so underrated because you see so many mindset coaches out there that haven't got a clue to therapy they haven't been to therapy i started going to therapy 10 years ago and the first time i went to therapy was when i had an eating disorder from boxing Mm -hmm. and i walked into this group nhs place and in there 19 girls just me and on top of that, many of them are gorgeous. Come out of it well. Stunning. Yeah, well, <laughs> I was so embarrassed and ashamed, I just walked out. Oh, fuck. I, I was there for the first one. I never went back. I was like, oh, 
I can't be them. I'm the only guy. So then I felt emasculated. Yeah. I felt like a loser. And when I told my friends, fucking therapist, you know what I mean? Like, don't fucking need that. Or, or only girls go to therapy, all of that shit, mm-hmm. you know? And all of the team was all built when therapy wasn't cool. In America, it's cool now. Yeah, yeah. It's fucking, it's, and, and to be fair, if you look at Tony Swimmer's performance, probably about 40, 45% of our coaching is therapy because mm-hmm. we understand that for you to perform at an elite level, you need to do the deeper emotional work. But the thing that sets us apart is the ability to listen from a leadership, business, high performance level. Because most therapist backgrounds aren't in high performance backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Most of them are in clinical and they, they lack the business, the entrepreneurial side. And that's really where yeah. everybody has that. And yeah. when you're able to combine that performance commercial background with the therapy, it's really yeah, it's yeah. a fucking nightmare to hire for. <laughs> I could yeah, tell you, yeah. no, I could tell you that. But when you when you have that and you start to understand that you can actually grow back your emotions from a performance standpoint, it fucking changes yeah. the game. So I'm so happy to hear that. You, you you said a couple of things in there that resonated with me. You know, when you said like, I felt like a loser. Mm. So when I was working at BMW and Mini. I went through a breakup and it was a messy one. Un- unfaithfulness. I'm not going to, I am going to say, when someone cheats on you, that makes you feel pretty shit. Mm. And I was in a bad, bad place. And when you work for an organization, a big organization like them, right, we're going to help you. You know, because I was getting into work, right, I'm going to fucking end it. Mm. You know, crying all fucking day, it massively affected my mental health. And they're like, we'll, we'll get you counseling. And the reason why I didn't want to talk about it is because I felt like there's something wrong with me. Mm. I don't want people to think there's something wrong with me. I don't want to feel like I'm, I'm a loser or people are thinking, fucking hell, something wrong with him. You know what I mean? So that massively resonated with me there. Yeah, and, you know, like some of the some of the guys we work with it's, and, and girls as well, that's one of their biggest fears. So that's what will stop them from going to just a therapist. Mm-hmm. Therapy's great. Therapy's good for... The analogy, I don't know if you saw my post mental health between mental health and mental performance mm-hmm. mental health being the hobbyist in the gym that's kind of trying to lose a couple of kilos and sort of do that and then there's an, a fucking elite athlete that's trying to win and dominate titles and, and whatever yeah. that's kind of where we we come in but a lot of people won't even consider therapy because they don't want to feel like a loser mm. and when you have that understanding that it's okay to not be enough it's okay to feel like that it's okay to be dumped on your ass mm-hmm. but that's not the end and that's actually what can begin to change the game. Once you accept that, because a lot of people, the three things that stop people from going to therapy or TMP or anything like that, number one, fear of opening the Pandora's box. If I open that box, what's going to happen? Mm-hmm. Number two, ego. I don't need help. I don't fucking need help. Blah, 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 blah. The one that shouts, I don't need help. is the one that, that, that usually yeah. uh, needs help. And number three, if it's not those two, it's usually understanding. I don't really understand what that, is yeah, yeah what it's gonna do and so, so somebody uh some so a, a client come in i won't, I won't share it because it's in a client session it's confidential he's like mate you guys are fucking therapy on steroids you're like the pds of therapy <laughs> I love that. yeah and i was like tell me more it's like i've worked with therapists for like five six years and it always got me okay mm. but it never got me to like fucking a different yeah. league and different level you know i remember when coach convention and it was the night before, and I'd met Dan. Mm. I started talking to him. I said, you know, I hadn't actually heard of Total Mental Thoughts. I'm sorry. I'm in my own bubble, bro. <laughs> okay. And he told me what it was. And then you t- spoke to me about what it was. I was like, fuck me. That's an amazing idea. And it literally stuck with me because any time I've said, oh, I'm out here for a podcast, or I'm going out here next month for a podcast or whatever, who's it with Total Mental Performance? I said, What's that? And I tell him, and I'm buzzing for you about it. Mm. I think it's a fucking unbelievable idea. And yeah, fair play. Our goal is to bring psychological freedom and peak performance to the world. Yeah, That's it. Mm-hmm. That's all we care about. For us, when there are people that... Can, and I could go and work in banking. I could go and work in the corporate sector and we would make loads more cash. Yeah, But we don't have the same values. So we're very lucky because everyone we work with are coaching entrepreneurs. So guess what? If their businesses grow and if they grow, well, they're helping more people. So we now have the network effect yeah. to help. Let's say what we, in our first, first couple of years, maybe 250 coaches come through the programs. 200, 250. I think 300 for our first, 
first couple of years and we're, and we're only two years old this mm -hmm. brand the, the logo that you see today that was designed literally two years ago yeah Mad. and it's still in its infancy but if you think of that to 250 let's say a low end i always go low end conservative figure mm -hmm. always let's say they only have 50 clients right you times 250 by 50 right some of them have got hundreds when you start to think on that scale. It's a lot of fucking people. Right. And not only that, but we're coaching coaching leaders. So when you guys learn and you pass on the knowledge and the wisdom, yeah. well, all of their clients get the knowledge yeah. and the wisdom. And, and that, that for us, that beats everything. Yeah. That I, fucking beats everything. You I'd know? say probably now 60% of my clients are coaches themselves. Yeah. And I fucking love that because I know they're going to be taken from me, which is cool. I always say, say to my clients who are looking to grow the business, do exactly what I do, but use your own personality. Hmm. That's all you need to do. Yeah. Because people, people, like I said at the start, people ain't fucking coming for my physique. They're coming for me. Hmm. Okay. People are going to come to you for you. Display your fucking personality. If you haven't got a good personality, you're shooting yourself a bit in the foot with coaching. In it's my not going to work. Yeah. No. If you've got a hell of a rig, you can maybe live with that. But when they learn you've got no personality, you're boring to work with. You need, you need to be doing both. But even you know? so, I actually... One thing that we really get our clients to do is embrace their individuality. Mm -hmm. Some people genuinely are, and they're self-described, boring. Yeah. But then the clients they attract is also boring. Yeah. And it so works. It's yeah, so it's and it works. And yeah. it's a beautiful acceptance of You attract of that. what you are. Yeah. You know? And uh, the fact that I can help them, they gain more clients. Brilliant. I know that they're going to be delivering a fucking shit hot service because they're getting a shit hot service from me. And it just goes round mm. and round and round. And those people then end up being like, Oh, well, if I'm working with him and he works with Christian, I want to know what it's like to work with Christian because he's another level. Because I, get, I, I am another level, hmm. you know, and I'm fucking so proud of that because I've seen so many people get to the top of the coaching industry and they drop the fucking ball. I'll never drop the fucking ball because I'm shit scared of dropping the ball. It keeps me up at hmm. night. If I can't deliver the service that I want to deliver, I'm, a, I'm pissed off about it. When my phone's going off in my pocket and I'm in a meeting, I, it's going in my head, in my head, who needs me, who needs me, who needs me. If I'm not replying within an hour, that's shit. And I don't beat myself up for it because I know that they're not sat there thinking, what's this fucking clown playing at? Why not I got a reply? They're not looking for a shit hot reply straight away. Because mm. they know I'm busy. It's fine. But I'm constantly trying to over deliver. I, I will over promise and over deliver at the same time. And I'm never going to drop the ball. And I want my clients that are coaches to learn that because then this industry is so much better. Where did you learn that from, Christian? Do you know what I mean? Hmm. And that's what I want it to be like. I know I'm not going to be able to do that for everyone, unfortunately, but that'd probably kill me as well. <laughs> so I think it gets to a point where you go, so I work with less clients than I used to, mm -hmm. a hell of a lot. And as much as it pains me, I also understand that for me to help thousands of coaches. Yeah, you I need can't, to pull away. It can't just be me. Yeah, But I find that having the art of surrender and surrendering control, hiring really good people and just creating space. Honestly, if you can handle the space. So Paul Sartre said, all of man's problems come from his inability to sit in a room alone with his thoughts preaching to the choir my friend right <laughs> so it's easy for us to run towards more 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 yeah. more more because at the end of the day we're running away from our own thoughts yeah so that's where i always challenge coaches to try and do some thinking time not compulsive thinking time but switch their phones off completely and just go right let's see what comes up yeah and the fear people have to open that door but often some of the insights some of the gold that you can unlock yeah. slowing down to speed up it's so fucking powerful mm. it's so powerful yeah. it's a constant learning pro process this so I've got one final question mate fuck it's a big one let's go if you had total mental performance how would you know fuck if you'd achieved it you sit there one day okay you're on a beach let's say your phone's off and all of your businesses are running smoothly because someone else is looking after them, no longer needs you, have no stress, no 
money worries. I can do what I need to be. I can do it from anywhere and have no stress. That's it. Do I think that's possible? I don't fucking know. Because mm. <laughs> I think anyone that's successful is going to have stress. But I've started saying this a lot to myself recently and to clients. I accept that I'm going to have stress. But it's how I deal with that stress. If you're the director of four companies, which is now technically am, I accept that that's probably going to bring stress with it. But I'm okay with that because I can fucking handle it. But I need that to be elite level. That's total mental mm. firmness. Love that. I love that. One final point on stress, and I love this. You'll know this intuitively as a bodybuilder. But a lot of people hear the word stress and they go, I don't want that. But think about it. How do you grow your muscles? Stress. you got to put it through a certain amount of stress. Mm -hmm. If you can change your relationship with stress, because there's a difference between bad stress and good stress, mm -hmm. and understand that stress is a fucking powerful tool. Mm -hmm. but we want to make sure we have the right stress. The BMW mini stuff sounded like bad stress. The relationship yeah. stuff doesn't sound like good stress. Mm -hmm. You pushing yourself to become the best coach you can possibly be. It's good stress. That sounds like good stress. Yeah. I oh, fucking love that. Yeah. Reel that one. I'm going to watch that <laughs> over and over again. Um, yeah, just harness the, the shit. Yeah. And be like, cool, man. I'm stressed. Good. I'd be more stressed if I had no fucking work. Mm. Simple. Well, look, you can you can squat just the barbell if you want. Yeah. <laughs> pretty fucking boring, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty fucking boring. <laughs> so if yeah. you can find the right barbells to lift that you think, mm. you know what? That challenges me. Yeah. And I like that. Yeah. And that's good. That's the difference between good. Too much. You, you've put on... The hundreds and hundreds of kilos you can break back yeah so there's a balance you probably want to work your way up to that yeah but uh mate it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much I for fucking, fucking just it. flying in for this mate it means the absolute world Standard. and uh i've loved it where can everyone find you instagram is where i majority base myself <laughs> um christian underscore physique collective um you can find me on the physique collective app where you can ask me anything that you want for 6.99 per month you can follow my logs Follow all our videos. We've got 300 plus educational videos now on the site that oh, I say free to use. 6 99 to use once you've signed up, it's free. Um, yeah, I think that's where you'll find me. Or Birmingham, if you ever want to, <laughs> if you ever want to see me in person. Birmingham. Amazing. Mate, so, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. Peace. Boom. Oh, How'd fuck, you find that? Fucking love that. You enjoy that? that? really good. It was good, on it? Yeah, really good. Good fun. Shit. And that's us out. Thank you so oh, much, my man. I need a pee.